Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the top-tier brewing stand. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Green Greetings. How are you all doing today? Oh, it's been one of those horrible days. Ah. Total pain in the ass. Everything going wrong. Everything coming at once. It's just, it sucks. Oh, no. Life sucks, God damn it! Sorry to hear, one man. shitty day. Yep. Oh, my God. It's just, just brutal. Just mm. brutal. The, uh... Too much crap to do, not enough time to do it, and everybody wants everything done at the same time. That is true. That's the way it goes. Yep. <clears throat> but we forge ahead. Yes. How's that? Uh, how's that Evil Three coming along? Uh, it seems pretty good. Um, everyone was very excited about the uh, new uh, selection of hops that uh, that we chose this time. Mm-hmm. They were saying that. Uh, it seemed really good. They were cool. real, real pleased. So uh, that will be ready. Just a uh, okay. uh, couple more weeks. Excellent. Yep. Are you going to uh, be around for for that, or are you um, on the road again? I'm on the road quite a bit. Uh, I've got next week. I go to Minneapolis. Uh, we'll look at. Uh, well, to work on with um, scientific societies on my new position um, as editor for MBAA. Mm-hmm. And the week after that, I pop off to uh, Denver um, to uh, do some video, uh, some photos and video for the next edition of Out of Brew, which is coming out uh, May, June uh, this year. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, Ah, and then immediately after that, I fly. <laughs> I'm flying uh, up to San Francisco, and then down to San Luis, San Luis Obispo, and then driving up to Paso Robles for the uh, the Northern California MBAA conference, mm-hmm. uh, district conference. So, it's. Um, I originally had scheduled to fly into San Luis like at 11:30 at night, but then found out all the rental car agencies are closed, mm. so. <laughs> Had to move it back a couple hours earlier to be able to get a car. Yeah, pretty much everything out there is closed at night except for bars and restaurants. Yeah, they roll up roll up the sidewalks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I bet you Blickman lives in an area where there's not much late at night. Well, that's true. <laughs> He's that's how he got into home brewing, I think. Right. If you if you want a drink, it's probably not available after like. 7 p.m. <laughs> and probably nothing on Sundays. Oh, that's true. You told me a good story about that once. So you have to have ID, and you can only um, you can't have like uh, an underage person with you, or any a person with you when you buy that doesn't have ID. Um, they they squawk at that. <laughs> <laughs> huh? So you just tell them to wait outside, right? Okay. Yeah, I guess. Duck down in the car. Yeah. Oh, that was his wife, so he was said, you know, this is silly. <laughs> his, his underage wife? Yeah. Did he marry like a 14-year-old? <laughs> I wouldn't put that past, well, past John well, Lickman. No, the, the, yeah. the clerk apparently thought she was underage. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, our good friend John Blickman, he's out in uh, God's country. And uh, he's making uh, God's gift to uh, the homebrew equipment. Uh, always using that uh, noggin of his to uh, come up with uh, interesting and uh, creative, uh, fun ways of improving your brew day. 
lots of lots of new equipment always uh always a cooking there at blickman engineering and our good friend john blickman has been paying for this show so you don't have to for a long long time so uh, the least you could do is go and check out BlickmanEngineering.com. Send a nice email to feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Tell them how much you appreciate that they support the show so uh, you get this uh, show for free. Anyways, uh, check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. All right, so uh, today we thought we'd do another uh, Q&A show. Um about yeast, you guys seem to have a lot of yeast questions, so uh, we gathered together another selection of your yeast questions, and we thought we would uh, go over them today to uh, I don't know, answer those questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes. There you go. Maybe attempt attempt to answer. Those we questions. will we will give it the old college try. That's right. There it is. All right, pornographic uh, Stephen. All right. First, first question. Now, first is this question. going to be multiple choice or? <laughs> is it A? <laughs> it might be. Just give up. Is it two? Mm-hmm. Uh, you said the old college try. It immediately put me in mind of multiple choice multiple questions. Choice. <laughs> is, is that what? Can we phone a friend? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really. Should we yes. call Blickman on some stuff? We can and... roll some dice. I don't know. <laughs> All right, this one's from Kevin Jones. He says, hey, guys, I brew mostly high-gravity beers, which is 1.080 and higher. Uh, As he moves towards opening a nanobrewery, I'm trying to think of the best way to save money on yeast. It's always been my understanding that the yeast left over from high-gravity beers is too stressed out to reuse. One of your old podcasts that I was listening to the other day said that this may still be possible if I made a starter with that yeast and only pitched from one batch to the next of the same beer. You talked about selective pressure. Is this really a good idea? If not, do you have other ideas on how to save money on yeast without a yeast bank or buying a propagation tank? Thanks. Well... Yeah, if you're worried about saving money on yeast, then I would question your your viability of opening opening a brewery and um, you know doing well. First off, you know maybe your pricing on your product needs to be higher or something. I don't know. Um, the uh, you know, and a lot of times people think, oh, I'll just grow my own yeast. You know, properly propagated yeast is not that much cheaper than buying it from somebody like White Labs or Y Yeast. So, you know, the sometimes people think that you can prop yeast real cheap, but um you know, it's one of those things where you got a bunch of ingredients, you got time, you got the tank, you got everything, all the, you know, the cleaning, the energy, all that that goes into it. Mm-hmm. And then you may not end up with as good a product. So, I don't know that you really want to be propping your own yeast necessarily. Um, and then, you know, if you want consistent performance, it's, you know, maybe again, you don't want to uh, prop your own yeast for that reason. I would say, though, that you can repitch yeast from a high gravity brews. It really, the most important thing, I think, is the initial. Uh, health of the yeast going into fermentation, you know, where you have maximized their um, uh, ability to withstand, you know, the high concentrations of alcohol. So, you know, you're, you've got your zinc, you've got uh, oxygen, you've got all the appropriate, you know, micronutrients that the yeast need, and, you know, you're treating them properly before going into this this high gravity environment the alcohol gets high the um you know and then when you select the yeast if you get them out of the high gravity environment and um you know treat them right then they should be uh able to do multiple batches i think i don't think you necessarily have to start a pitch uh Every time you brew, I think you could mm-hmm. repitch that. I mean, uh, and yeah, I don't know. You, do you have any thoughts on that, John? Yeah. Um, 
I, th I think you I think you uh, hit the main point is that um, you know you need to prepare yeast for high gravity brewing and repitching uh, with with the zinc additions you know nutrient additions uh, when you're when you're building them up or initially pitching them um, maybe pitch them to a intermediate wort depending on um, how long you intend to store them between batches. Um, I think, you know, he says he doesn't want to build a yeast storage tank or, you know, propagation tank. Um, and he says, says he wants to, um, you brew mainly high gravity beers. Um, an option would be to have a lower gravity beer, something, you know, 1050, 1060 ish that would be um, a beer that he could harvest yeast from, say. And that's, you know, if you look at stone, that's kind of how they, you know, propagated their yeast. They they harvested all their yeast from their, you know, lower gravity, uh, lower gravity IPA um, beer, you know, uh, beer, and then uh, used that yeast for all the higher gravity beers. The other option for him is dry yeast. Um, dry yeast is, you know, less expensive than uh, large pitches from Y yeast or Y labs. Um, a lot of people winning medals with at GABF with dry yeast beers these days. Um, and when I say a lot, I mean like you know a dozen um, that I that I know of at the last uh, competition. So yeah, the yeah. only problem with dry yeast is um, well the 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 biggest problem with dry yeast is the lack of selection if right. what you want to brew is you know available as a dry yeast you can certainly go that route um, but it's not um, it's you're not going to be able to do uh, you know all the different yeasts that you like to do right right yeah there is that you know limitation of selection mm-hmm Yeah, I think um, you know the the key thing is going to be making sure you got proper nutrition uh, up front, so the yeast are at maximum health, and then uh, you know get them out of that environment, um, you know when you can, you know as soon mm -hmm. as you can properly, and then uh, make sure to provide them their proper nutrition again. You know, or yep. like you're saying, if if you brew a bunch of uh, smaller beers, then it's not much of an issue, but. Yeah, I, I, I guess, uh, I guess if you're selling the beer outside the brewery, then having everything high gravity is not necessarily the end of the world. But if you're doing your own tap room, you got to have something lower. Um, you just uh, you'll sell a lot more, and the customers will be much happier with a low gravity beer offering. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, variety. Yeah. Some yeah, options. And, and people like to, you know, they like to have one and then, um, you know, something special and then just go to a regular drinker is what I see. All right, let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20 gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman kettle cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy all grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Since the first time the Brewing Network microphones turned on, more beer was behind it. More Beer sponsors the programming on the BN because, like you, they love brewing. And like the Brewing Network, they love sharing their knowledge. 
morebeer.com isn't just a website to place your next equipment or ingredient order. Morebeer.com also gives you access to free beer information that will make you a better brewer. Go to morebeer.com and click into the Learning Center. You'll find podcasts, technical facts, video tutorials, and more, including access to The Buzz, More Beer social network of more than 5,000 members, and some of them might even be crazier about beer than you are. Get over to morebeer.com today and take advantage of The Buzz, The Forum, The Learning Center, and make sure you're signed up to receive the newest More Beer catalog. More Beer, bringing you absolutely everything for beer making. Hey guys, what will it be? I'm not sure. What do you recommend? A lot of people seem to like the Hefeweizen. Is that a German Hefeweizen or more of an American-style wheat beer? I'm not sure, but I can give you a taste. Okay, great. Great. The Cicerone Certification Program certifies and educates beer professionals in order to elevate the beer experience for consumers. Unfortunately, not every bar is staffed with certified beer servers who can guide their customers through a beer list. Here you go, guys. Let me know what you think of the Hefeweizen. Oh, yeah. That's definitely more of an American meat. But I can hardly tell because this beer just smells like sour butter. I wonder how long it's been since they cleaned the draft line. Yeah, and look at the bubbles on the side of the glass. It's filthy. Somebody should tell these guys about the Cicerone program. For sure. How about we head somewhere else for another beer? Your server should give beer the same respect you do. Request quality. The Cicerone certification program offers four levels of beer certification, in-person classes, and course books for beer professionals. Check them out at Cicerone.org. The Cicerone Certification Program. We know beer. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. Brew strong. All right, we're back. I don't know. You know, we're talking about yeast. Um, and did you know how many uh, unique and awesome yeast strains uh, White Lamb has? A lot. A whole bunch. So much. So many. How do you decide which one to use? Well, if you go to the White Lab site, go to their bank, their yeast bank, they have a great new search feature that allows you to uh, browse their entire selection. You can uh, specify various parameters that you want to uh, search on the yeast. And it'll pop up all the yeast that'll fit. Let's say you want to make a you know a wit beer or something. You can type in wit beer, and it'll show you all the yeasts that would be appropriate for for making a wit beer, or even some that are like a little bit outside the norm. And then you know you've you've cut your list down considerably, and uh, uh, it's real cool. And then you can see like attenuation. You can see their notes and tasting notes and things like that. And uh, it's just a, a quick search from. Uh, their yeast bank. So you go to whitelabs.com slash yeast bank to try it out, and you get a chance to, to pick the, the perfect yeast for your next brew. So check it out. All right. What's our next question, pornographic Stephen? This one is about oxygen at 8 to 12 hours. Um, on the December 19th, 2016 podcast, Jamil recommended hitting a big beer. Uh, approximately 1.084-ish with a shot of oxygen 8 to 12 hours into fermentation. Uh, do you re- recommend this as an alternative to making a starter or in addition to a starter? Especially important when you have pitched a starter or just something you should always do regardless of whether you pitch a starter? Thanks, Rod. Well, way back in December of 2016, I was doing a lot of heroin, so... Not really sure I was ah, speaking clearly. Kind of strung out, and I was strung out. Oh, okay. Well, and now I'm glad I've cut, you've I've cut back to glad you know, to, uh, New Year, New You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, way dialed it back. Glad you're back. <laughs> um, I, for me, I, uh, I that is not a a replacement for a starter. It's not. Um, it is something you always do on on bigger beers. Um, so you still need the, the, the nice healthy starter. You still need, you know, oxygen at the beginning. You need all those, those various things. What this extra dose of oxygen does is, um, help build up the, the cells to handle 
uh, the higher gravity uh, ferment, the higher alcohol levels that are coming. So it helps keep those uh, cell membranes more, you know, pliable and, and more able to handle the, uh, the stress of the high, high uh, alcohol environment. Mm-hmm. You're giving that, uh, that first generation of, of yeast growth, um, you know, additional resources they, so that you get uh, stronger uh, reproduction, you know, during the adaptive phase and the high growth phase. We all want higher reproduction. I mean, really. Yes. Who doesn't? Stronger reproduction, in fact. Stronger reproduction. I like to reproduce strongly. Yes, vigorously for extended periods of time, et cetera. We we do a new show called Reproduce Strong. Huh? There you go. (laughs) Ah, yes. Um, Well, and... I know a lot of times people kind of freak out about that, uh, adding additional oxygen, you know, once everything's right. fer- ferment- fermenting, because that's one of the things we're told is, oh, no, 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 once it's, once it's fermenting, you don't want to add any oxygen, because then it's, right. you know, staling and all that. But with enough active yeast in there, you can add oxygen, and it's surprising. They, they take it up, and you don't get any off flavors that I've ever noticed. Yeah. In fact, well, the other part of the thing is the time at which you're adding it. You know, mm-hmm. eight to twelve hours in, you know, you're they're still actively, you know, in their adapta- mm-hmm. adaptive phase, and so we had, they haven't produced a lot of alcohol that could be oxidized um, into off flavors and so on. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be rapidly taken up. Mm-hmm. You know, thirty six hours, forty eight hours into fermentation. No, then you're going to start having some some you know off effects. Now, when I do this, I I don't use the same full amount of oxygen that I use before pitching. I actually scale it back, and I'll do about a third to a half of what I normally do. So that was always just kind of a gut feel thing. Mm-hmm. I don't have any necessarily uh, scientific uh, proof of, of right. that one, but um, no I'm side always, by side. So. No, um, it's always just just work for me. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know. Yep. I'm guessing on that one. That is my studied opinion of uh, what it might be. All right. Uh, next question. This one, uh, just this question for Jamil and John. Uh, could you guys give some pointers on the show in regards to repitching yeast? I've only done it four times now, but each time the yeast I've thrown out some off flavors, mainly acetaldehyde. Um, his process is when kegging, I leave a half inch or so of beer on the yeast cake, swirl it up, collect it in the sanitized mason jar and leave the jars in the fridge with the lid on loose until my next brew day. I use the Mr. Malty yeast calculator to determine how much I pitch and let the yeast warm up to fermentation temperature for a few hours before pitching. I used some second-generation coning yeast that had been in the fridge for approximately four weeks, and the off flavors were so severe, I ended up dumping the whole batch. The last few times I've done it uh, with W. Uh, LP001 and 002, the yeast were pitched five to six days after harvesting. Much cleaner ferments, but still not as clean as my experience with first-generation yeast and a yeast starter. Is five to six days still too long? Should I still be making a starter to refresh the yeast? What else can I do to ensure the yeast are happy? If you recommend yeast rinsing instead of leaving it on the beer, should I use distilled water or acidified tap water? Lots of questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, um, one factor could be the leaving the lid on loosely. Um, the yeast, you know, are going to, you know, um, have exposure to oxygen in the fridge, you know, even though it's cold, um, and they will be living off their glycogen and trigulose reserves in that time, um, which would leave them kind of depleted going into the next fermentation. Um, that could be the reason um, for higher acetaldehyde 
um, you know, if they're going in, going into the next fermentation in a nutrient depleted state. Um, he, you know, because he did say that the yeast that had been stored the longest had the worst off flavors. Um, what are your thoughts, Jamil? Well, a <clears throat> couple of things. One would be usually when there's a, a, a green apple character in a beer, <clears throat> it's from, you know, kind of incomplete fermentation at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's probably the most common. And, and when that happens, a lot of times it's because somebody's fermenting just in kind of an ambient. Uh, they'll go, well, you know, I'm fermenting at, you know, 65 because the room's 65. And they're not controlling the actual fermentation temperature, the mm -hmm. temperature of the beer. And um, so what happens is, you know, the yeast starts slowing down and then, you know, the room's too cold and, you know, the it crashes the yeast before the yeast are able to uh, clean up after themselves. So you see that right. a lot of times. Or sometimes if you pitch too much yeast, um, it'll go ripping along and then the whole thing crashes before, you know, cleaning up. That's a, a common problem with uh, uh, too much yeast. Um, it could be, you know, again, temperature. where You're running the whole thing at a much higher temperature, and that's an issue. Yeah, but you know what makes me think? I mean, since he's saying the the one that sat four weeks it was really strong, I'm wondering if it's truly acetaldehyde or if it is perhaps some sort of contamination, some sort of uh, souring bacteria or something like oh, that. Yeah. So it's hard to to know for sure without actually tasting the beer, but that a lot of times when there's kind of a uh, tart character, some people will think of that as, you know, kind of the green apple. And if that's the case, and the longer it sat there, the more, you know, uh, bacteria were growing in his, uh, in his uh, harvested yeast, the higher that would be in that, that beer. So I was thinking that that could be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be. So I'd say, um, you know, that's that's one thing to watch out for. And, you know, just in general, when you're talking about repitching yeast and advice on repitching yeast, the the hardest thing on repitching yeast, and a lot of times people worry about all the other little aspects of it as, as to like, oh, do I have, you know, X number of mils exactly of yeast or you know, um, how am I determining how much yeast to, to use? And they worry about, you know, various pitching rate calculators and things like that. The important, the most important thing is harvesting healthy yeast. You know, not just any yeast, but you gave your yeast so that the nutrition you give your yeast before a batch. People think that that's all just for that batch of beer. It's not. It's actually nutrition for the next batch in a way um the yeast that you're going to harvest is going to be healthier more more vital more viable and um that's going to assist with the second batch that you do so um <clears throat> that's one of the things on you know harvesting yeast repitching re is you got to make sure that the beer you you're harvesting from the yeast were healthy on that yeah, And then you need to make sure that the method that you're using for harvesting and that all the vessels and the openings on, you know, whatever container, or if you're using hoses, or whatever, that all that is sanitary, that you're not introducing bacteria or wild yeast. You've got to watch out about, you know, contamination from the air, all these these things so that, you know, when you harvest it, you're and you got to worry about your initial pitch um, as well. You know, again, the, the batch before. Was that uh, you know clean? Did you did you introduce contamination there? Because that's going to grow in that beer. And then if you're harvesting that yeast, you're letting it sit for four weeks. It's growing. You know the bacteria is growing there, and the wild yeast is growing there. And then you pitch that in the next one, and you're just increasing and increasing and increasing your your bacteria and wild yeast. So you need to be careful of that. You want to just make sure that uh, 
you know, you're doing everything in a, in a sanitary method. That's why a lot of times, you know, some of the yeast folks will, will frown upon repitching yeast because, well, people aren't, aren't handling it right. And so the, the quality of their beer drops the more they repitch. And um, so uh, I would say that those are the things to, to worry about, mainly, you know, mainly the, the foremost things, uh, nutrition, sanitary, sanitary uh, you know, handling. And then it's, you know, yeah, if you if you, you stored your yeast for, you know, more than a few days or a week, you really should, you know, make a starter, get it woken up, you know. And it also, the starter helps separate out the dead yeast from the healthy yeast. The dead right. yeast will all be on the bottom. The healthy yeast should be pretty much all in suspension. And so that gives you... Just a way of isolating out, you know, not throwing in a bunch of dead yeast into your beer and ended up with all the uh, off flavors from, from the uh, dead yeast. So that's one of the reasons to do that. But it also, you know, validates that you have some healthy yeast there. You could you could put a, a pitch of yeast away and certain yeasts will be 99% dead in two weeks. Some yeast, they'll be fine four weeks out just depends on the strain the nutrition that they got before they went into storage you know how they've been stored all that will have an effect as well so um i think uh those are some of the aspects of you know repitching yeast um if you're going to rinse it um you can use uh distilled water you can use tap water um, just make sure it has been, you know, boiled and it's, you know, clean. Um, I think, you know, either generally is fine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anything else to add to that, John, about repitching? No, I think you covered it real well. All righty. Well, and uh, <clears throat> that uh, Craft Brew, their Catalyst Fermenter, they got that oh. covered pretty pretty well, I'd say. They're using a plastic that is uh, 90%, uh, 90%? I don't have my notes in front of me. Very, very scratch resistant. It is. I don't want to misspeak here. Yes, 90% more scratch resistant than other plastic conicals. 71% less oxygen permeable. Low profile design. It's uh, lightweight, snugly fit in your fridge or right on your countertop. They've got this stand that... uh, uh, you know, makes it nice and compact and easy to move. Uh, cleaning's a breeze because the entire top of the, the thing snaps off, so you can get into to clean that thing properly. And uh, instead of using like a carboy brush, it'll scratch things up. You can use a nice soft uh, soft sponge. Um, and the great thing is, it's got that big three inch butterfly valve on the bottom. You can screw a mason jar on there. Talking about harvesting and repitching yeast makes it super simple. You can sanitize the valve. Uh, you know, get your sanitized mason jar, screw that on there, open the valve, let that, that yeast dump out into there, close it up, and, you know, uh, a nice way of transferring your yeast without uh, using hoses or any of that stuff or tilting things upside down. Um, and it'll take any size uh, mason jar. You can use that to dump true, but you can use that to harvest yeast. Uh, pretty slick. And then just loosely put a, a lid on there, put it in the, uh, put it in the fridge, and uh, you're good to go. Um, they, and one of the things about this is I, I believe it, it'll handle up, uh, past boiling temperatures. So you could actually pasteurize this thing. Even if you did get a bunch of scratches in it, you could, uh, you know, heat it up and uh, not have to worry about, uh, Burn the, the hell out of it. Sanitary. Right. That's neat. Yeah. And, uh, you can learn more at craftabrew.com. All right. Let's take a short break. When we come back. Uh, more of your questions right after this.
If you work in retail sales, the restaurant industry, or are a new craft beer enthusiast, or you know someone who is, you have got to check out Beer 101. Beer 101 is an online course created for anyone wanting a quick introduction to the vast world of craft beer. Beer 101 covers the history of beer, brewing ingredients and processes, vital stats like ABV, SRM, IBU and gravity, styles, tasting, glassware, and pairing beer with food. The Beer 101 course is offered by the Brewers Association at craftbeer.com, also home to the truly awesome Beer Style Finder, a visual guide to every beer style. Quickly play with color, bitterness, and alcohol content to interactively explore the entire world of beer styles with a gorgeously designed interface to your favorite beverage. The new Beer 101 course and new Beer Style Finder are only available at craftbeer.com. Craftbeer.com, celebrating the best of American beer. Hey there, BN Army. Have you heard the latest at Hop Tech? Since Hop Tech has doubled in size after a huge expansion, Jade and Roberto can stock even more of the best quality home brewing supplies and equipment. Over 60 kick-ass varieties of hops and malts, monster truckloads of quality brewer's yeast, including white labs, Y yeast, and multiple dry yeasts. They even have all grain systems from Grain Fathers and Ruby Street Brew Systems, thanks to Jade, the brand new all grain brewer. And don't forget about their 10% discount to all BN Army members. Jade and Roberto are waiting for you and all of your brewing questions over at hoptech.com. Hoptech, totally not sucking since 1983. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanishev, and I want to tell you about Heretic Evil Twin. You might be familiar with my homebrew recipe, which uses massive late hopping to create a balance between the malty sweet and the hoppy bitter, along with an outrageous malt and hop character. I wanted a beer with the same bold hop and malt character, so we played around with the homebrew recipe until we were able to make a great commercial version, too. We've created a beer rich in malt character, full of caramel, toast, biscuit, and an ever-so-subtle roast note. On top of that, we piled in an insane amount of Citra and Columbus hops at the end of the boil, as well as in dry hopping. This damn-the-cost approach to hopping gives Heretic's Evil Twin a great blast of citrus and tropical fruit that can't be matched by any other hop. The result is a bold, malty, hoppy, but easy-drinking beer. This is our top seller, our flagship beer, and I couldn't be prouder of it. Cheers. To find Heretic Beers near you, click on Find Some at hereticbrewing.com. First Amendment. Watch out! Do you like beer? They make beer. Watch out! Do you like friends and fun? They make friends and fun. Watch out! Do you still like to have a good time? The 21st Amendment. Watch out! The 21st Amendment in San Francisco, located at 563 Second Street, two blocks from the building where baseball is seen and played. Try their beers in the pub or try them in the can. Featuring... Monk's Blood. Made with real monk. Watch out! So why not have the best time of your life? Go to the 21A and Sean O'Sullivan will personally greet you with a can of... Monk's Blood. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! This advertisement is not in any way affiliated nor associated with the 21st Amendment Bar and Pub, nor its subsidiaries or affiliates. This telecast is not copywritten by the 21st Amendment for the private use of the Brewing Network. Any use of this telecast without Jamil Zanishev's consent is prohibited. Suck it, JP. The Vault, created by White Labs. The Vault is a collection of new, creative, and unique yeast strains from around the world. These strains have never been available to homebrewers. Most have not even been available to professionals. You have the power to release the yeast. Through the Vault, White Labs is giving you the power to decide which strains are put into production and giving you the opportunity to brew with these strains. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault and pre-order the yeast strain of your choice and encourage your friends to do the same. Once 250 pre-orders have been achieved, White Labs will put that strain into production. The strain will be mailed directly to your doorstep, ready to make the beer you've always wanted to brew. This program was created with the home brewer in mind. White Labs is relying on you to help release these strains, which may blaze the way for future new and unique beers. Help release the yeast. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault. Vault. 
back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. John? Yo. Do you like to uh, save money on beer, food, and brewing supplies? Yes. But I also like to uh, get top quality when I purchase them. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you how you can do that. You can check out the uh, new AHA Brew Guru app. Oh, yes. And that's going to lead you to uh, all the homebrew shops and pubs and breweries and all that. Uh, around you. I mean, it's got a little mapping thing where, you know, just like Google searching, but this is based off of the uh, the Brewers Association database, so you get kind of, uh, you know, the killer data. And one of the things that uh, you get out of this that you can't get off of Google is which ones have an AHA discount. There you go. So that's, that's, how, you, that's how you can save some money. You go on, you, you can, you can uh, go to these uh, places that are given the AHA discount and uh, save yourself quite a bundle as an AHA member. And that Brew Guru app, that's just another member benefit. You can download it for free even if you're not a member, and you can give it a, give it a whirl to see what it, what it looks like. But uh, uh, <clears throat> if you're a member, you get that, uh, those discounts. You get the Zymergy magazine. You get uh, you know the member rallies. You get... Uh, whole ton of great stuff including uh uh you know you can uh you know if you go to the homebrewers conference uh you essentially need to be a member for that uh same thing for the jbf member session you can uh, get into that as well so uh lots of benefits for for being a member and using the uh, brew guru app so you can download that at the uh app store you can get that uh from the google play store and uh, it's for uh, the iPhone and uh, Android devices. So check it out. Brew Guru from uh, the AHA at homebrewersassociation.org. All right. Um, <coughs> next question, uh, Mr. Mr. Stephen. This one is about decoction versus sparging at higher temperatures. I'm looking at improving my German wheat beers. That doesn't sound like a yeast question, but that's fine. (laughs) I don't know how that one got in there. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you know, but it's a question. That's a question. I mean, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, Okay, try reading it again. Okay, here we go. (laughs) I'm looking at improving my German wheat beers. Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference in my beer with using a decoction on modern modified malts. But would a sparge at high boiling temps have a similar relationship to a decoction? Is the tannin mm. issue... Why are you reading all the words that are there? In the sequence Because I they haven't really paraphrased. It's really hard to... I don't know what he's really saying. Don't, uh, of... Well, don't paraphrase. Just read the whole thing. <laughs> you just give me shit for reading the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I was giving you shit for the fact that I couldn't understand anything of what you were saying. Because I can't understand a lot right, of what saying. Right. It didn't, it I'm didn't, trying to it translate. It's not going well. It didn't well. make any on, sense. Beverly. I'm sorry that I... It didn't I've, make any sense. So. There you go. It's okay. You I was may just, speak. I was just making fun of you. I was just saying, sound it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just silencing you now. That's me. Use, use your words. See you later. You're not... <laughs> Ooh... <laughs> I was just uh, saying, don't try and paraphrase, because it's coming across as uh, incomprehensible. Is the tannin issue wouldn't be as bad as some make it out to be? <laughs> here. You just want, here, just, uh, <laughs> just take it. Um, Carl writes, Carl from New Zealand writes, team, a question for the Bruce Strong Hour. I'm looking at improving my German wheat beers. I agree in the last cast, I wouldn't be able to tell a difference in my beer with using a decoction on modern modified malts. So we had done a show on decoction. And he says in the last cast, podcast, abbreviation for podcast. uh, The last podcast he agrees with. Yes, he agrees with us and says, you know, he's not going to be able to tell a a difference. Um, And (laughs) Actually, it's kind of funny because it says uh, 
um, in my beer with using a decoration on modern modified malts. Hmm. <laughs> so that kind of so, does throw you off as you're reading it. I know he meant decoction, but yeah, and I said decoction. Right. Well, because I knew he meant decoction. Yeah. yeah. So you should did, I have said you decoration? Didn't, you didn't even notice that it's a decoration there. <laughs> but he could be a loyal Adam and Eve customer. He could. He could. He could. Um, modern modified malts. But <clears> would a sparge at high slash boiling temperatures have a similar relationship to a decoction? Is the tannin issue <laughs> would be as bad as to make it out? to be uh okay is it possible the tannin issue that many have spoken about uh, would not be as bad as some have made it out to be okay the tannin issue he's with, thinking there's uh, an issue with sparging at high temps boiling water etc etc he says i haven't tried it but i'm keen to hear if there are any advantages at all and when if sparging at higher temperatures than the average 76 degrees C is ever appropriate. Is there a time when high uh, sparge temperatures are appropriate? No. No. John says no. So <clears throat> the one of the advantages to decoction is when you're boiling the mash – it helps free up, liberate more starches. Um, you know, the the better your crush and the better modified your malt is and the better it is at taking up the water, the less benefit you get out of the decoction. It, it, that's all right. that is really happening. Um, one of the reasons that you don't get a tannin issue, I think, with decoction is the pH is still high enough when you sparge the ph tends to start dropping rising uh, uh rising throughout the uh uh starts to rise through the out the uh course of uh your sparge oh, right and you run into a uh, you can run into a difficulty where towards the end of sparging there isn't enough buffering left in the um in the grains to keep an appropriate pH level. And that's when the tannins can be extracted. That's why high temps early on. I imagine you could sparge with fairly hot water early on and not really see a tannin problem. And you might slightly improve your extract. Wouldn't you think, John? Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. Um. I don't know how much it, um, how much real gain there is in that regard. Probably next to nothing. Right. The uh, one other reason that uh, the the temperature of one seventy one seventy five, you know, max for sparging uh, is is called. If you read um, Kunza, he also talks about the fact that. You're looking for residual alpha amylase to convert any of those starches that you free up, you know, in the course of sparging, uh, you know, and, and as that as that temperature rises, uh, you want to convert those starches to uh, fermentables or at least convert them to sugars. Um, if you were to sparge with boiling water, you would, you know, denature those and, you know, any remaining alpha amylase and potentially end up with this re with this extracted starch going into the beer. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another caveat for why you wouldn't want to simply just raise your sparge water temperature. Um, and then going back to our other discussion of decoction, the other thing you're trying to do is gen generate some melanoidin character with the boil. Um, and you're not going to get – you're really not going to get much melanoidin generation simply by running hot water through the grains. It's, uh, you know, it's the, it's the boil of the wort of the grains in the decoction that's going to generate those Maillards. Well, that's the theory. Yeah. But um, I think you get just as much in the boil in the kettle as you're getting right. in the separate yeah. decoction. 
Yeah, and so if, I think we touched on that also. That, uh, a 90-minute boil could equal a 30-minute decoction plus a 60-minute boil right? in terms of beer flavor. Well, especially because, you know, you when you do a decoction, you pull a portion of the mash. You don't do the whole thing because, again, you denature all your... Right. All your enzymes. Uh, so you pull a portion, you boil that, and then you throw that back in. So you're doing these little small batches versus when you boil the, the, the liquid, the whole beer, you've, you've got the, you know, the whole volume that you're working with. Right. So I think it's more effective than a small decoction pulled to the side. Good point. Yeah. Well, I thought it, I thought it was worth mentioning. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else on decoction while we're talking about yeast? <laughs> I don't know that that that, <laughs> that that my bad my bad I slipped that one in there by mistake. I thought they were all about yeast. What can I say? What can I say? It was Steve's fault. You can say that. Just throw me under the bus. I'm ready. All right, my body's ready. Get ready. I'll throw you under the bus. Um. Another question? Yep. Time for one more. Hello, asshats. <laughs> I brewed a fresh Yeah, you could have paraphrased that part. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> I brewed a fresh hop pail, and it looked kind of gray after a month in the keg. And I thought it was strange, but blamed it on the fresh hops. A month later, I brewed a northeastern IPA, and it was really hoppy. My brewing partner and I decided to let it age and drop out some of the hops. Cause it was too hoppy. My keg was very hazy and citrusy, but a few weeks later, it has a gray hue as well, especially in the head. I wonder if you had any explanation. Attached picture. And it's, look at all that gray. Yes. No, uh, he sent a color picture. It's, I printed it on a black and white printer. Um, yeah, it, Really, what you're seeing there is it. It looks to me, you know, more like um, I don't know yeast or something in suspension. Is really what it looks like. Um, it could be, you know, a, a, low flocculation. Yeah, or it could be, you know, just a polyphenol protein complex. Haze. You know, haze mm-hmm. in there. It's just um, I think a trick of the light. It's um, you know it's something that's real light in color, and then um, you know if your lights are like fluorescent or you know, compact fluorescence or something like that, they tend to give everything. You know you can have a, a fairly blue uh, artificial light, yeah, and it makes um, you know it, it's just uh, it, you end up with uh, you know kind of a gray looking uh, haze from things that are white. Um, you know, that's one of the things like, uh, on red beers, if you look at them under like a blue light, they tend to look real brown, um, throughout a lot of that artificial light. So I, I, I think it's just that. I don't think it's anything unusual. I mean, I see lots of murky beers that <clears throat> look that way, that way out. Um, I would just suggest maybe he starts, you know, working with findings and, uh, let's things settle out and tries along those routes. I mean, nothing wrong with clear beer. And then he wouldn't, they wouldn't look gray. That's a good idea. <laughs> I wonder if since he said it was an IPA, I wonder if he's trying to do uh, an East Coast IPA recipe with some extra oats or starches or something in there. Well, that's what he's saying the second one was. Ah, uh, okay. Um, oh, that could, <laughs> that's very well the cause then. Right, so it's just super hazy, yeah. and um, you know, it just gets kind of that gray look under certain light. I'm sure if you know you move it out to a different light, go outdoors with it or something, it wouldn't wouldn't look quite as uh, quite as dingy and uh, drab. Um, I just bought something from uh, Williams Pruitt the other day. Oh, what would you buy? What was it? Oh, I got one of those uh, inner tap uh, forward sealing beer faucets with the interchangeable spouts. 
Oh yes, those are nice. Yeah, I had not tried the uh, the latest iteration of those, and um, I'm getting ready to put another like 38 taps in our tap room, and I'm like, I haven't been that thrilled with the uh, the Perlex, to tell you the truth. The forward ceiling stainless Perlex, they were the, the, they leak like horribly, oh. and um, so they, and so they stopped making them. They actually just came out with a new version. Um, because I guess so many people complained. Uh, so the new one might be fine, but these inner taps they sell for about half the price, and um, they they seem seem pretty nice. So I I got one and uh, hooked it up at the, in the tap room, and I'm waiting to see the feedback from daily use for a few weeks and see what my people say. And see, so far I I used it the other night and it looked uh, it seemed it worked nice for me. I was pleased and it seemed uh, real solid poured real well uh but williams brewing has them they have the full line of intertap forward ceiling beer faucets and at the best price because you know i'm cheap and i google the prices and they have the best price on those with the interchangeable spouts you can screw off the spout and put on screw on like a stout faucet without changing your faucet as you just the, the spout changes pretty cool huh that is that's pretty innovative you can screw on a growler filler uh-huh. And I know you like screwing growler fillers. I, I love screwing anything. As well as uh, they've got a new grain mill motorizing kit that features a, a gear motor that, that turns the mill at the proper 180 uh, RPM without belts. They've got uh, a Mark II work pump, a magnetic drive high temperature pump. Starts at only sixty nine ninety nine. does a job of pumps costing twice as much. They've got the Brewer's Edge mini regulators, as well as their line of King keg King kegs and disconnects. They got uh, quality all steel bottle cappers from Italy. Their own line of hydrometers, California wine kits, much more. They've got a ton of stuff. They've got fresh ingredients. They've been doing this since 1979, and they got some of the best customer service in the business. Check them out, WilliamsBrewing.com to browse their selection. Their, their website is pretty nice too. Works works a treat. It's uh, pretty snappy, even on uh, when I look at it on my phone. And uh, like I said, good pricing and uh, good people. I get that stuff out to you quick and uh, uh, check it out. If you're looking for faucets, I would give the inner taps a, a whirl. I, the only negative I saw on the internet, somebody said, "Oh, they're not you know machined very well" or something like that. You know, they seem like poorly made. Not the one I got. It looked, looked pretty sharp. Of course, I got the stainless one. And uh, all stainless, forward ceiling, and uh, it looked, uh, you know, high-end to me. Uh, I was I was very pleased. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to buy 37 more of them. So there you go. All right. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we will wrap up with uh, Q&A about yeast after this. Brewing Great Beer is a process of continuous learning, and the best books on every aspect of brewing can be found at Brewers Publications, with more than 50 awesome titles like Modern Homebrew Recipes by Gordon Strong, Designing Great Beers, The Ultimate Guide to Brewing Classic Beer Styles by Ray Daniels, American Sour Beers, Innovative Techniques for Mixed Fermentations by Michael Tonsmeyer, For the Love of Hops, The Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture Culture of Hops by Stan Hieronymus and Radical Brewing Recipes, Tales, and World Altering Meditations in a Glass by Randy Mosher, plus many, many more. These are the books and the authors with the knowledge to push your brewing farther than you thought possible. And you'll find them all at fine homebrew and book retailers everywhere. And visit the website at BrewersPublications.com. Brewers Publications, all the best on beer and brewing. Your support of the Brewing Network means everything to us. We couldn't produce shows without you. And we love giving you something extra for that support, like Brew Your Own Magazine. You already know it's a great brewing magazine full of recipes, equipment how-tos, discussions of beer styles, and brewing techniques. Whether you're new to brewing and just starting out or you're an old pro, you'll always learn something from the articles in Brew Your Own. Plus, they're amazing special issues like plans for building a brew. 10 system, 250 classic clone recipes, and the Home Brewer's Answer Book. Brew Your Own Magazine and BYO.com are awesome resources for any 
Bethany Brewer. Whether for yourself or as a gift, when you subscribe or resubscribe from the Brewing Network homepage, you directly support programs like this. Get a great magazine and support the Brewing Network. Subscribe to Brew Your Own right from the thebrewingnetwork.com. to brew has never been so disgusting this is brew strong all right maybe you got time for the squeeze in one more quick one uh and if you're listening live you can stay tuned and we've got uh, another two shows coming yep so Sweet. there you go Found the lost yeast question. A lost yeast question, yes. Yeah, it's in my pants. Is it about lost lost yeast in your pants? Yeah. Yeah, I bet you that a lot of yeast gets lost in your pants. It does. That's why I found it. <laughs> All right. Uh, how to calculate the last third of fermentation. Uh, hello, I see some of your recipes from the BYO and Brewing Classic Styles that say to ramp up the temp by the last third of fermentation. Like, for example, your dry stout recipe has an original gravity of 1.041, a final gravity of 1.010. Now I think to get the last third of that, you do 41 minus 10 equals 31 times 0.33 equals 10 plus 10 equals 1.020. So have I calculated it right? Yes, I would say that that is correct. However... Um, so a lot of times people don't want to take samples, gravity samples and no, um, and, uh, and, uh, it it depends on so many different things. I mean, that is correct, but generally, um, you know, you can have a faster fermentation start, slower at the end, a lot of different things. One of the things that I like to do, if you don't want to take a, a gravity sample, one of the things you can generally do is you'll see fermentation if you if you're very observant you watch the flow of of bubbles you see your your fermentation is bubbling at a certain rate it starts to increase and it's rapidly and then it's chugging away at, at, at your top speed and then you'll notice it starts to taper off that point where it tapers off that's pretty much two-thirds of the way through and you could go ahead and call that the remaining third. And I think that that's close enough. The point of it, of raising the temperature during that final third, is to keep the yeast active anyways. That's the point, is you want to keep them going. And, and as you see fermentation start to drop off, that's the point you want them to not drop off. You want them to keep going. So you don't necessarily have to measure it and be that precise, but instead um, just... Uh, you know, look for that slowdown of fermentation and start knocking the temperature up there. Anything to add to that, John? Nope, you nailed that. <laughs> and that's what she said. <laughs> 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 oh, speaking of nailing things, <laughs> have you, uh, uh, you could go to Adam and Eve and uh, get your, your, your nailing goods uh, together. Uh, Adam is determined to help you spice things up in the bedroom, and they're backing that up with uh, this special offer. If you go to adameve.com, use the offer code Jamel, J-A-M-I-L, and you're going to get 50% almost any one item when you enter the offer code. That in itself is a good deal. But when you enter the offer code Jamel, you are going to get their Big O kit for free. The Big O Kit is uh, their exclusive Climax gel and a mini vibrator. So now you've got a new way to get him or her off. Uh, what girl or guy uh, wouldn't love that? You also get your entire order sent for free. So hurry up. use the, Go to adamandeve.com. Use the off code Jamel. You're going to get uh, 50% off just about any one item. You're going to get the free Big O Kit, and you get free shipping all for that. Good people at adamandeve.com. And uh, been a long-time supporter, so check them out for all your your nailing needs. What about the meet-and-greet with uh, me? <laughs> meet-and-greet, yes. And you could enter to win a special meet-and-greet with pornographic uh, dildo Steven 
uh, star of Texas Crack Wrangler uh, at, at, so, by purchasing something at Adam and Eve. It's uh, cheaper if you do a group. <laughs> if you get a group, meet and greet. <laughs> yes, that sounds special. All right. Good show. I think uh, we'll have to get together and do this again sometime, John. I think we will. Yeah. Right. If you want to, if you want to keep hearing us do these shows, I don't know what's wrong with you, but there's the way to keep it going is to contact our fine sponsors and support them, especially ones like John Blickman at Blickman Engineering because he's been paying for the show longer than anybody and paying more for the show, so you're getting it for free. So you got to email him at uh, feedback at bookmanengineering.com. Tell him how much you appreciate it if you want to see this uh, continue to go. Uh, you can also check out the Brewing Network store, the brewingnetwork.com slash store. There's goodies in there like hats, hoodies, uh, glassware. No no glassware anymore. Uh, Evo's not paying any attention. Um, all sorts of stuff in there that uh, when you buy anything in there, it goes directly to the bottom line of the Brewing Network and helps keep shows like this on the air. Until then, everybody, Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong.